think we are getting started. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this ISIS to Professional Development Committee webinar. Today's topic is Indigenous Data, a few perspectives. And this is a co-hosted session with the ISIS the DEI Data Resources Interest Group. I am uh, one of the co-chair of Professional Development Committee. My name is Wei Yin. I'm a data librarian at Columbia University. Uh, we have another uh, co-chair, Sarah Young. Uh, she is also uh, in today's co-host list. You can find her. Or if you have any PD questions, you're welcome to send uh, Sarah any uh, chats or questions is directly. We have a PD member, Olivia Given Castro from Temple University, also in uh, in the participant list. Uh, she is a co-host. And Olivia, Sarah, will be happy to answer any of your questions is related to Professional Development Committee. And uh, I want to say very special thanks to all the ICSDEI Data Resource Interest Group members, especially all the co-hosts here. Uh, they are Barbara Bodlin from Princeton University, US, Alexandra Cooper from uh, Queen's University, Canada, Lucia Constanzo from University of Guelph, Canada, Ha Quinn from the University of New Mexico, U.S., uh, Tatiana Zarenskaya from University of New Brunswick, Canada. They are working together for a list of resources related to DEI data. And uh, you probably will see they post a few links in the chat box very soon to share uh, what they did for the past year. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, without their collaborated efforts, we are not going to have this three wonderful speakers today. And let me introduce you, all the three uh, wonderful speakers. We are going to have two presentations reflecting on issues indigenous communities are currently facing. The first talk will be presented by Dr. Diana Lewis, and the second one will be presented by Dr. Stacy Allison Kessing and Camille Callison. I will start to introduce the first talk's presenter, then let Dr. Diana Lewis to finish uh, his talk. Then I will give you bio introduction for our second talk's presenters, Dr. Stacy Allison Kessing and Camille uh, Callison. So the first talk, as I mentioned, will be presented by Dr. Diana Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis develops indigenous-led approaches to environmental health risk assessment, governance, and data management. She is an assistant professor and Canada Research Chair, Tier 2, in indigenous environmental health governance in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Geomatics at the University of Guelph. Uh, she is Mi'kmaq and a member of the Spagnik First Nation of Mi'kmaq, the Atlantic provinces of Canada. Dr. Lewis will work with researchers and students to develop and disseminate leading edge and adaptive indigenous models of health risk assessment that reflect the needs, interests, and uh, worldviews of ind indigenous peoples. In a relational worldview, human health is intricately tied to the health of the land, water, animals, and plants of a shared environment. Her approach provides a transformative opportunity to advance research within indigenous epidemiologies. Diana is committed to the recruitment, development, and promotion of both indigenous and non-indigenous trainings in an environment that fosters collaborative engagement with communities that respect indigenous autonomy over decisions that affect their lives and the right for communities to have control over the data that belongs to them. Uh, Diana, now it's all yours. Please unmute yourself and share your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ninda Luisi, Diana Lewis, Delea Wisa Beganagadig. Um, so I'm just introducing myself and the community that I'm from is Sabaganagadig First Nation in Nova Scotia, which is on the Atlantic uh, 
coast of Canada. Um, so I'm here today to present you um, an overview of the governance frameworks and protocols that I embrace in my research that ensures the highest ethical standards are followed that respect Indigenous data sovereignty. And so what I'll do is I'll walk you through the research, some of the research projects that I'm involved with to demonstrate um, how I uh, implement these measures. So in 2010, I started to work with a community in Nova Scotia that had a cultural connection, historical connection, traditional connection to this beautiful body of water. And in my language, we would call it Aseg. And Aseg translates to the other room. Um, and so the translation implies the close connection that the community had to this body of water and what this, this area provided to the community. So you can imagine on the east coast of Canada, um, we're very reliant on seafood. Um, so the community would go down to this body of water for food, for berries, for medicines, um, very strong connection to this body of water. Unfortunately, this is what it looks like today because um, the province allowed a pulp and paper mill to build nearby and the pulp mill owners and the province approved that the mill would dump its effluent into that beautiful body of water. And so the picture on the bottom left is what it looked like when I started to work with the community of Picto Landing First Nation in 2010. So the map on the right side of this picture shows you the proximity of Picto Landing First Nation um, and where the pulp and paper mill is. And the pulp and paper mill piped the effluent under this harbor across this land. And then the Boat Harbor Effluent Treatment Facility is what was once known as Aseg. The women were very concerned about the health impacts of that effluent treatment facility on their community. And there had been an environmental health monitoring committee in place that had been mandated by the federal government to oversee the health of the community. And they had been conducting studies since 1993 that were concluding the health of the community had not been impacted, but the women felt otherwise. Um, but didn't have any data to back up their claims that they were really concerned about health impacts um, the community was experiencing. So one of the first things that we did was we worked in a community-based participatory approach, taking the lead from the women in the community to develop a survey that outlined the concerns of the community. And we ended up with a survey that was 72 pages long, 297 questions that took each person uh, 90 minutes to complete. We ended up with a 59% response rate um, in the community. And so you can imagine the amount of data that we had, the quantitative data that um, the women would be able to use as evidence base going forward. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute, but what I wanted to talk about first was um, how you develop community-led and locally relevant, culturally safe governance structures that um, ensure that you are reflecting um, the culture of the community that you're working with. And so 
this kind of approach is intended to meet the ethical standards, not only of the university where you're working, but of the ethical, ethical standards for the community. And by doing so, it allows communities to uh, promote decision-making, so they have the governance support um, to support getting back to a state of health that reflects um, their values and traditions. So one of the things that um, was shared very early on in the research relationship with the elders in the community was a story of the very first days of the effluent flowing into Osseg. The elders remembered going down to the shores of Osseg and watching as the effluent flowed in. So imagine it's 85 million liters of effluent every day that was being pumped into that beautiful body of water. And within days, they're, they're watching the fish die. And in a relational worldview, Indigenous people have responsibilities and obligations to all of creation. In Mi'kmaq, we have a word, Misi Nogama, which translates to all my relations. Um, we have responsibilities that when the elders watch the fish dying off, they felt they couldn't protect the fish. And so they felt they couldn't live up to their obligations to um, the fish. And when they were sharing this story, when I first started to work with the community, almost without exception, the elders would cry as they recalled those days of going down to the shores and watching this happen. And so it took me some time to understand the significance of that story. But the story is really illustrative of how you come to understand from a cultural perspective what is happening to Indigenous people when they are not able to fulfill their uh, responsibilities and obligations. And so we have words in our own language that when Aseg, so if you look at the figure on the left side of this screen, when Aseg was healthy, we could have we could thrive as Mi'kmaq people. And the worldview that we are operating within, when we use our own language, we can illustrate the close connections that we would have to the air, land, and water around us. And so Gisult Melki Godin translates in Mi'kmaq to nature and to the Mi'kmaq, that is the place of creation. We have another word, Wedjiskaliadink, which translates to where we sprout it from. We are rooted in the landscape. And so when Indigenous people talk about having close connection to place, um, to their traditional lands. It's where we believe our identity comes from because we, we believe we are rooted in that landscape. Another Mi'kmaq word we have is still Nuoltik, which translates to how we will be Mi'kmaq, how we know how to be Mi'kmaq. And Nadugalim is values and norms that we learn by being on the land. And we learn those values and norms when our elders and family members are able to take us out on healthy land, air, in the environment and teach us protocols and responsibilities and our language and so on. And the figure on the right side demonstrates that when the pollution started to enter Aseg. It's now the Boat Harbor Effluent Treatment Facility. All of those relationships that we have to knowing how to be Mi'kmaq 
are disrupted. And so we can't um, continue to pick berries because we're now afraid of the berries. We can't eat the fish or pick the medicines. We can't fulfill our obligations and our responsibilities because now we're fearful of that area. And so from a cultural perspective, we can demonstrate that. But what um, I'm finding in my research is that is sort of not easily understood by people when we use our own languages and our own worldviews to explain how we're impacted. And so in my research, I also use quantitative data that says the same thing. And I'm only going to present a couple of um, tables here. I, As I mentioned before, we collected um, data from 297 questions. So you can imagine uh, the amount of data and the variables that we have. But one of the things that I wanted to remind you is that from 1993 till about 2014, when we had this data collected, this Joint Environmental Health Monitoring Committee had been telling the community their health had not been impacted. And using the current risk assessment methodology, um, there's this standardized methodology that's for the general population that isn't appropriate to be using for Indigenous populations because it doesn't capture a lot of the ways that Indigenous people are impacted, nor does it use proper definitions. And so the work that we're doing in my lab is to um, address those gaps and come up with a new methodology that will reflect this work that I'm talking about now. So one of the first things we did is we said, well, we need to use a proper definition of health for Indigenous people. Uh, when you use a definition that reflects the social determinants of health, it doesn't go far enough to incorporate all of the things that make an Indigenous person healthy. So an Indigenous person to be healthy has to have not only balance between physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health, they also need to have balance with the health of the environment, the health of their community, the health of their family. But we also have to take into consideration the colonial history that we have endured. And you can do measures for all of those things. Um, and if you read my the literature that I put out on this work, you can see um, where I talk about this. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm just presenting a few things. So using the proper de definition of health um, and just asking the standardized question compared to a year ago, how would you rate, rate your health? And the answers are poor, fair, um, uh, good, excellent. And it's a standardized question so that you can compare to other populations. So had this Environmental Health Monitoring Committee, even in all this period of time that they were operating, asked the community how they rated their health, they would have found that a third of the community was saying that they were experiencing poor to fair health outcomes. So they were not um, enjoying good to excellent health outcomes. When we look at mental health, we would have found that half the community is reporting that they have felt down or depressed in the past year. Um, and so on. So you can look at that chart. And then in the next table, what we did is we're looking at comparing the health outcomes um, for Picto Landing First Nation compared to First Nations in the province that they live in, in Nova Scotia, and First Nations nationally. And when 
the government of Canada uses a social determinants of health approach, they would say, of course, you're experiencing poor health outcomes because it's known that Indigenous communities, First Nation communities, um, don't earn as much as other communities. And so we looked at that argument to see if it stood. And we said that it, it would make sense according to the social determinants of health that the more money you make, the better your health outcome should be. But when we looked at that in Picto Landing First Nation, we found that despite people making more uh, higher income, we found that they still experience much lower percentage of good to excellent health than comparable populations. Um, I collected data in 2019 again, the, um, the mill, it's a long story, I won't get into it, but the mill actually is closed. The Boat Harbor remediation facility is being remediated. And we did another study to look at health outcomes. So now we're into a longitudinal phase of being able to compare health outcomes. And if we're looking five years later, we're still looking at over a third of the com community participants are still rating their health as fair to poor. Almost half of all adults rate their health as fair to poor compared to just under a fifth, so 20%. So we're looking at 50% of adults in Picto Landing First Nation are saying their health outcomes are fair to poor compared to 20% of all First Nations in Nova Scotia and just over 20% of all First Nation adults in Canada. I now have taken the work that I've done with Picto Landing First Nation and I am working with three communities in Fort Chippewan, Alberta, that are exposed to the Alberta tar sands. Um, the community is in the northeastern part of the province. They're downriver from Fort McMurray, where the Alberta tar sands are located. And the communities are uh, Athabasca, Chippewan, First Nation, Miccosu Cree First Nation, and Fort Chip Metis Nation. And again, um, no one has studied the health outcomes in these communities. Um, just showing you some headlines of what they're dealing with. Um, they're downstream from some of the largest um, oil sands projects in the world. Um, the In the past year, there were tailings leakings from some of the um, tailings ponds that were went unreported. And when the communities found out that these leaks had been unreported, they also found out that it, the leaks had been happening for about nine months and the province and the proponent had not reported it to the communities, nor did they report it to the federal government. That's being investigated at the moment. These are just some pictures of the environmental conditions around the oil sand. So you can see that the communities would be um, concerned with air emissions as well. I work with another community in uh, southwestern Ontario that is um, has the uh, landfill for the city of Toronto sited next to their community. And the landfill, um, the community has not had health impacts studied from the impacts from this landfill. Uh, I work with advisory committees in the communities in Northern Alberta, and I work with an advisory committee with uh, Oneida Nation of the Thames. And what we're doing in both of those areas are developing culturally relevant frameworks 
survey instruments, protocols that guide research to make it appropriate for those communities. I have an in, uh, a lab that um, we are working to um, develop the capacity of the communities and the capacity, whoops, I'm sorry, capacity of um, students, capacity for um, just the process itself to um, have a structure that reflects how data sovereignty would play out. And so I'm funded by um, Canada Foundation for Innovation that has funded uh, the establishment of my lab that ensures that I can implement an OCAP compliant lab. So OCAP, for those of you who may not know, stands for Ownership, Control, Access, Possession, meaning that um, the community always owns the data. And while we might um, house it until they have the capacity to repatriate the da data back to their community, we have protocols in place that ensure that we are able to um, secure their data. So we have uh, met international standards, HIPAA standards. We design the research for, uh, for to protect the privacy of individuals. And we follow our tri-council policy statement on doing research with indigenous populations. The infrastructure that we have in place is, is to ensure that the data is securely transferred to secure servers at the university. Everybody who works in our project signs non-disclosure agreements, and we have research agreements with each of our communities to ensure that they are confident in the process, that they own the data, they, um, and they get co-authorship uh, on all of the publications and um, are jointly making decisions around the governance of our work. Um, these are just some pictures of the lab that we have in place. And um, I just wanted to give you a sense of what the structure looks like to uh, implement an OCAP compliant lab. So we have secure workstations where uh, students who are working with data are in private locations behind um, uh, privacy screen so that uh, the data is um, not, not out in the open for other people to see. But the data that we have where the students come to work, we have um, security built into who can access the room. So we have identification cards that are uh, programmed so that only those who have authorization to get in into the lab uh, can do so. Um, and it's there's a lot more information about the lab setup um, that I just don't have the time to get into, but it gives you a sense of the amount of work that's required to set something up to be OCAP compliant. So thank you very much, Walaliak, and just to acknowledge that these are some of the funders for the work that I've done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, we are going to save questions for later, but I'm pretty sure a lot of people want to discuss with you about your lab and your research project. And uh, everyone, uh, before I introduce the second talk and the talk presenters, I want to emphasize uh, without the DEI interest group members' collaborative efforts, we are not going to have today's three wonderful speakers. You are going to find the DEI 
data resource interest group members, Barbara, Alex, Lucia, Todd, and Tatiana on the co-host list. If you are interested in get their special list of data resources related to DEI, you're welcome to reach out to them, contact them directly. You can find them on the co-host list. Uh, my name is Wei Ying. I am one of the co-chair of Professional Development Committee. You are going to find another co-chair, Sarah Young, and our committee member, Olivia Castro from uh, Temple University from the participant list. Uh, they are also on the co-host list. And uh, of course, uh, there are three speakers. You've already uh, heard Diana, and you will see the other speakers on the co-host list. They are uh, Dr. Uh, Stacey Allison Kesson and uh, Camille Callison. Uh, they are going to talk about very different angles. So that's why today's topic is a few perspectives. So let me introduce Stacy firstly. Stacy is an assistant professor in the Department of Information Science at the Halsey University in Halifax, Canada. Uh, Stacy engages in research related to linked data and metadata and issues related to equity and justice. Uh, Stacy is the co-lead of the Respect for Terminology Platform uh, Project, RTPP, and is currently the chair of the Teaching and Learning Community and the member of Council of the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Association and Indigenous-led association centered in Canada and sits several advisory bodies. A citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, Stacy has with kinship connections to the Georgian Bay Métis community. Camille Callison, Totan Nation uh, member is the university librarian at the University of the Fraser Valley and uh, a passionate cultural activist pursuing a PhD in anthropology at the University of Manitoba. She is committed to creating meaningful change related to equity, diversity, and inclusivity in the library, archival, and the cultural memory professions. She is the founding chair of the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance and co-lead of the RTPP project. Uh, Camille is a member of the International Federation of Library Association's Indigenous Matters Section, North American Regional Division, and the Advisory Committee on Cultural Heritage, and the IEEE P2A90 Recommended Practice for pre uh, Provenance of Indigenous Peoples Data. She serves on the Board of Directors for the Canadian Research Knowledge Network Board of Directors, uh, the British Columbia ELN Steering Committee, the ARCA Advisory Committee, the Council of Pacific and uh, Prairie University Libraries, and the Council of Post-Secondary Library Directors of British Columbia as Secretary and President-Elect. Uh, their project, this is a co-presentation uh, by Stacy and Camille, their project is dedicated to advancing the development of a dynamic multilingual platform for indigenous terminology that can be used in libraries, archives, museums, and data systems worldwide. So Stacy and Camille, feel free to unmute yourself and start your talk. Thank you. Thank you. So Suck here. So thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't realize you were going to read the whole bio. But it, <laughs> made me feel, it made me feel a little bit exhausted. So maybe that's why I have been a little tired lately. But anyway, um, uh, thank you very much for that. And we're really honored to be here today. And I'm just joining you from um, Stolo Tumuk, which is the sacred land of the Stolo people, um, also known as the Fraser Valley here in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Um, and I'm at the University of Fraser Valley. So our, our campuses are all located on uh, solo up so I'm joining you today from their territory. Um, and uh, I wanna, uh, yeah, I guess, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone on this call. I'm uh, currently located in Mi'kma'ki. So um, I wanna say hi, Diana from your from uh, Mi'kma'ki. I'm in um, sometimes called Jabuka, Chibuktuk, which actually means the Great Harbor, which isn't actually Halifax because I'm not in the water. 
um, currently, um, but I'm really honored to be um, working on these uh, on these lands and um, really so delighted to hear Diana's talk uh, actually and, and hear those um, connections to this to this territory. Um, all right, so just give a quick outline of what we're going to talk uh, about today. So give a quick, I should say quick in quotation marks, introduction, some background on the problems um, we're talking about, uh, some information about our project and some ways we are working and thinking about data and conclusion and some questions. But before we get into that, turn it back to Camille. Uh, so I'm a member of the uh, Toltan Nation, so it's pronounced Tol and Tan. And uh, as you see in the right um, of your screen is a place called that we call Toltan, um, and it shows uh, the Sikkim Canyon. So we're located uh, in northern British Columbia, and you can see on the little map on the left-hand side. And the the uh, beak was our our nation looks like um, um, a raven with the, the wings in, and the, the beak is in the Yukon, and the tail feathers are in Wrangell, Alaska. So we're the people of the Stikine River. Um, and as you can see, our wonderful highway, which is on the right of the uh, canyon uh, cliff. So this is a place of creation for us uh, that we call Tiskia Chokana. So that would be loosely translated as ravens. Um, And I believe that knowing our history, and this is what I've been taught, really informs us our present and what we need to do and gives us direction for the future. So I grew up really um, in a blended um, uh, kind of cross-cultural um, environment as uh, Teltan and mixed uh, European heritage. And um, I, I learned a lot from my dad going out in the mountains on uh, pack horse, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner. And we're, he was born in uh, Shesley, um, and we're members of the Kwok family. And so I wanted to also note that we are, we have never ceded or surrendered our land at the cost of our own blood. And this is when we were celebrating, um, you can see in the picture of the dancers, we wear white blankets, we intermarried with the Quinket people's peace um, down on the coast. And uh, uh, we have celebrated over 100 years of our Teltan Declaration, which was signed in October 18, uh, 1910. Uh, so we were celebrating 100 years, and that was signed by our head chief. And, um, and a little bit about me. So I'm of a mixed background. I'm originally from Thunder Bay, Ontario, and I grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and lived for a long time in the Toronto uh, region before um, moving at the end of 2022 to uh, Mi'kma'ki. Um, as you heard a little bit in my introduction, I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario with uh, kinship connections to the Georgian Bay uh, Métis community, sometimes called half-breed community, uh, which actually stretches out. So my kinship connections are out through the upper Great Lakes, but also included um, the historic Northwest. And so that's a picture of me and my dad at Quebec Falls outside of Thunder Bay in the top photo. And the bottom photo is a picture of one of my daughters holding some sand um, from uh, Lake Superior. So this uh, project that we're going to be talking about today, the Respectful um, Terminology Platform Project, is really underneath the umbrella of the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance. Uh, which is really, really addressing um, the need for an Indigenous community um, engaged in work within a library, archives, museums, and other cultural memory institutions. And so we really were a community of practice um, uh, starting in about 2017 when we uh, worked with um, CFLA, FCAB on the Truth and Reconciliation Committee report answering the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission's calls, uh, report and calls to action uh, that were released in 2015. And um, the CFLA is actually the Canadian Federation of Library Associations and went on to uh, form Indigenous Matters within that area. And so we became a not-for-profit in March 1st, 2021, and we held our uh, inaugural gathering in February 2022, and maybe we'll just switch to the next uh, so really our mission is to create and um, create an association of people that are an alliance that are 
uh, uni to unify and amplify the voices of Indigenous people. So in Canada, that is First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Um, and so we want to make sure that we distinct we are um, distinguishing that uh, we're not um, really pan what we used to refer to as pan Indian is across the country, but that we are uh, here to network and nurture a community of practice as it relates to Indigenous knowledge, culture, um, cultural memory, language, and Indigenous ways of knowing. And uh, with that, we have um, um, uh, five different communities, as you can see and also to an uh, just newly formed Indigenous um, Knowledge Standing Committee and two projects that both Stacey and I are part of with the RTPP and Indigenous Curriculum Projects that we're working on currently. Uh, with hopefully a few more to come in the near future. So what's the uh, problem we are trying to address? Um, I think um, it might be helpful before we get into the project itself to illustrate um, a little bit of that. And um, so given we're almost into June, uh, which in Canada is National Indigenous History Month, and uh, this is a time often when we see all oh, book lists and things come out. So what if you wanted to um, look at this book or look for a, a particular book that is recommended, for example, this list from the CBC, so Indian Coping Mechanisms by Billy Reed Belcourt. And this is a screenshot of uh, a catalog search. And if you can just take a look at some of those subject terms on the side there, and you may or may not notice um, that some of those terms are not terms we would necessarily um, use uh, in sort of our day-to-day our sort of -day ways of talking about um, literature or people's um, in particular, uh, we see references to um, Indians throughout here, particularly with terms like the faceted uh, application of subject terminology or FAST, uh, Library of Congress terms. Um, so this is a really uh, a problem throughout and we can see the Library and Archives Canada has these notes within their catalog that, um, that reference the problem um, in their systems of having these terms that are present. Um, and while they're working on it, um, not really solve the problem entirely. So one of the problems that we see are terms that are racist, antiquated, or outdated. Um, and so this again can be terms that are racist, which are problematic um, as well, but also terms that become outdated. So communities that have um, uh, gone um, back to their original names, and we don't see those terms um, referenced in our information systems. So Camille will mention, I think that your own nation has recently changed the spelling of their name. So, uh, uh, and then we don't, and, and, go ahead. Yeah, I, just and I, I never thought that that would happen. So that was very interesting to uh, watch it the move to the linguistic spelling, uh, which caused a little bit of consternation, I will admit, in the community. And um, I think we're still working through that because uh, people have various ideas of how that will work, um, mainly because of the symbols. And so I think that's one of the things. Yeah. I think there So we are... can see, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I think there are many nations that are doing a similar thing. And this is part of where our challenges have lied with uh, some of the other um, uh, uh, work that we've done in the past is how to keep that updated. Yes, and so um, as Camille was mentioning, changes um, in the uh, language set that's used that could, you know, for those many of you on this call are, are data people, you know, that, that can present certain technological um, challenges. Um, some of you may be familiar with this uh, book, The Marrow Thieves by Cherie Dimeline, and um, again, a long list of subject terms. But what I want to call your attention to here is what is actually missing. So here is the way that Cherie describes herself. Um, and uh, so historic Georgia Bay Métis community, but if we go back to these lists of terms, there's no mention of, of that community name anywhere here. Instead, there's references to um, what we call the 
the um, Indians of North America kind of problem. So we see that that is an additional problem that is misnaming or incorrect terms. So we have racist, outdated, problematic terms that way. We see misnaming or incorrect application of terms um, in different kinds of information systems. And then the last example I want to turn to is, um, this is from the Open Data Nova Scotia data set for Arts Bank, the Arts Bank catalog. And I just, uh, hopefully you can see it um, highlighted in this box, um, an artwork by Alan Silboy. And you can see the data points here, are accession title date, last name, first name, size, and medium, which isn't a lot of information. We can see the same artist here. Um, this is artists in Canada, so a federal um, uh, data data set. And we see um, a little bit more information. So um, birthplace um, and a little bit about uh, you know, where data provenance, the so file locations and biography. But again, what we're missing, if we look at this uh, biography from the National Film Board, we can see uh, that he's named as a Mi'kmaq artist. And what we don't see in any of those other data sets is any reference to being um, a member of uh, Mi'kmaq Nation or Millbrook First Nation as a member, rather that was referred to as, as a birthplace, which is a geographic location rather than um, referring to someone's um, nation. And I've also, we've got a screenshot here of uh, a film that is located in the NFB's um, collection and Camille, I don't know if you want to say a little bit so we can see here, it, there is indigenous Well, I think that this has been, yes, thank you so much, Stacey. And I think this has been one of the um, really more um, seminal pieces that has happened from the Indigenous Materials Classification uh, Schema, uh, which was implemented first at um, uh, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And it is a further iteration uh, of the Brian Deere classification and and that has been revised many times. It was brought to BC, to the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, or UCIC, and then on to um, Wheatwatt Library, which is now a library at the, at the at University of British Columbia at UBC by Dr. Jean Joseph. And, um, and I think that that is really important to note that there's been many iterations since then. There was another one in 2017 at UBCIC. And from that, we took and uh, revised it. So it wasn't so BC-centric, uh, because it had become very BC centric due to the collections that it was um, classifying and organizing. And so now it is much more um, uh, Canadian centric so that it really comes from the East to the West and there's also facets in it. So this was one of the first times we were able to do it without any, uh, because everything is uh, digital. Um, and so we could actually uh, um, describe it in a way with many more subject headings and many more locations to be able to actually link it to uh, different definitions. And as you can see, the subject headings are quite different than they would be if they came through Library of Congress or Dewey Desk. So we can see that particular example is a problem of terms that are missing or absent. So it's not simply that when we talk about problematic terminology in relation to data that it's always um, outdated terminology, there are additional problems such as absent data points, and that can be as much of an issue um, or similar in, in issues to um, problematic terms that are present. So we have problematic or, or outdated racist um, terms, um, terms that are not the correct term, so misapplication of terms, and then we have missing or absent um, terms when they might be appropriate um, to have. So just as, a, as another point to mention that it's important in relation to thinking about these particular issues, and I'll refer to the Canadian Tri-Agency Data Management Policy, that there really is important to have a distinctions-based approach, which means that we can't think about one size uh, fits all. Um, in reference to um, Indigenous um, people. So really thinking about um, what is appropriate to each particular um, nation or situation. I'm going to hand it back to Camille to talk about how this, while we're talking about what's happening now, it is not a new, uh, newly identified issue. 
So I just wanted to actually say that uh, one of the things that we really try to stress is that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And um, I think I just gave a little bit of this uh, uh, timeline already, um, talking about the Brian Deere classification system, which was actually developed in 1974. So we are at 50 years where people have been doing this work off the side of their desk. And you can see uh, some really kind of uh, seminal points here where things have changed to be able to uh, to include um, the work that's been done. And even uh, within um, NICLA and the um, uh, joint work that we worked on with um, Canadian Federation of Library Associations and when we acquired um, uh, some seed funding in 2023. So we'll just switch to the next slide. And as Dr. Jean Joseph, um, who is of the Suetun and Navidene, um, uh, First Nations librarian um, uh, uh, um, created in her address, which I was fortunate to uh, read out due to her not being able to be there at the last minute, is that one of the most basic, basic acts of respect and recognition for a human being is to be known by your own name. So let our people be known by their own names. And this is very particular as far as... Um, um, as far as really when we look at things underneath the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and really human rights. Um, so we'll switch to the next one. So really what nations, what names nations are using and how that language changes as we just described with even my own community, which had never changed their name previously and then started to make those happen. And so what happened with that is that we decided that because of that call out um, uh, within, um, uh, within uh, the work that we've been doing, uh, we started with really place names. And um, I'm just gonna skip down to the indigenous ontology that maybe, uh, what is the, I'm sorry, the uh, interrupt. Oh, I'll, <laughs> sorry. Um, so just uh, as a, particular point or question that we have as sort of, or something to think about is what are our responsibilities to the stories, knowledges and data um, that we manage? And um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Camille to maybe talk about um, this early work that we started in uh, and was released in 2019. Well, as part of the recommendations for the Truth and Reconciliation Committee report, it was to work on um, on uh, both subject headings and classification and really that um, changing um, how we think about um, the way that we organize our knowledge. And so because of the um, uh, charge from Dr. Jean Joseph and in consultation with other people like Dr. Cheryl Matoya from uh, University of uh, Washington, now retired, uh, really we decided to start with place names because that's so um, connected to our identity and who we are as, in, as um, First Nations or Métis or Inuit people, uh, many of them are places on the land. And as within my nation, there's actually three spots that we call Teltan. Um, and there are different spots for fishing camps in the old, old village. And, um, and so I think that that's really important to uh, note that even within our community, we know which one we're referring to by the way that we talk about it, but it's still the same order. Um, and there's also a lake and a river, and I think it's really important to think about it in that way. And so really starting with people's names and how they call themselves was really critically important. Um, but very fast, it became out of date. And even um, uh, specifically for the example of my community, that's already out of date now. And so how do we sustain this and ensure that it's dynamic and able to uh, respond to the trends that we are um, that we are seeing within communities for self-determination and bringing back their languages. Um, because we know that, you know, even uh, 25 years ago, just over 25 years ago, the last residential schools um, shut in 1997. So I think that's really critically important to remember that we are, that we're working with generations now who are bringing back that knowledge. And so we ask that, um, uh, that we started to uh, think about it in that way. So after that uh, work that was actually released in on National Indigenous Peoples Day and in June of 2019, we ended up having some um, reorientation after 
um, kind of rethinking our approach and which was the beginnings then of the Respectful Terminologies platform project. Um, I won't read this slide in particular, but instead of focusing um, on libraries, which our previous project um, did a little bit more, is to think more broadly about thinking of how to ap apply terms across, uh, across domains. So we asked people when we talked about, um, when we had a, a, a conversation, a webinar, which was attended by almost 500 people uh, in May 2nd in 2022, I hope I'm right on that date, and then um, to imagine the creation of a respectful framework of descriptors, identifiers, and keywords that will leave an imprint of reverence for all others in the way that we organize our information. And I think this is critically important as our next generation see these subject headings, because in library catalogs, they are outlined in blue where people can go and search through them and go through um, that process. And if they are a slur word or a derogatory term, it becomes very problematic because we are re-traumatizing many people. And this isn't just referring to Indigenous people, but this is happening in library catalogs that are, um, uh, that are um, coming from a colonial, um, mainly Christian, white, and heterosexual. Oh, um, uh, Sanford uh, Behrman, uh, in his um, in his well known quote about uh, how that's happening. So, how do we create that imprint of reference for all others in the way that we talk about them and do our? So the project. Um... Again, I'm not going to read the whole slide, but uh, it's really to create a more just and equitable society to transform the way we do knowledge organization. And I think for everyone listening um, in this particular webinar, it's, it's really thinking beyond just the terms itself, but the whole system that we use to govern or, or um, create uh, terminology that we tend to use in information systems. And in particular, I've uh, we bolded this uh, one point that an expression of Indigenous data sovereignty. So really thinking about those connections between, um, you know, that Indigenous peoples, Indigenous nations have uh, the right to be called by the terms they call themselves. And um, thinking about how we uh, create systems that allow for that to happen. And underlying this is really the rights as laid out in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which Canada has signed on to. And BC um, uh, was the first to put it into law and, um, uh, and then um, Canada also adopted it. So if we go to um, Article 31 and where it says that Indigenous people have the rights to to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. And I think that that's very important for us to, um, to emphasize, as well as our uh, technologies and our cultures. And so I think it's really important for us to uh, remember that this is really underpinning a lot of the work that we do, both as um, Indigenous peoples in Canada and along with our allies, whom we always uh, uh, very much appreciate. So along with this, uh, with, with UNDRIP is also um, considering um, the principles that are being um, expressed or, or um, put out by GIDA, so the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, um, as well as the CARE principles for Indigenous data governance. Um, and some of you may be familiar with CARE. If you're not, you should um, uh, go look them up. Um, and also, you may be familiar with FAIR. So it's be fair and care. So working on those two things together are, are important to um, rethinking how we also do terminology work. And Camille and I are both working on this IEEE um, new standard. Uh, so Camille, I don't know if you want to mention anything about the IEEE standard. I think that there's a webinar on the GITA site right now. And I, I know that we are reconvening in um, in. Uh, next week, actually, and hopefully we'll have more out in June for everyone to be able to have a look at. But there is uh, webinars available right now on the GITA site if you wanted to have a look at some of the work that's been going on with that and we'll just move on to some of the new. So part of the way that we uh, really organize our work and we want to 
uh, pay uh, respect to um, Berna Kirkness and Bernard and the work that they did with the four R's. Now, I believe that relationship was always embedded in the center of it and having uh, been there as part of um, uh, my educational journey um, as, as a Teltan woman going to um, the First Nations House of Learning when it first opened and Verna Kirkness was our first director there. Um, that's the way that I learned it with relationships in the center and, um, and really talking about reverence for all people, respect for others. Um, principles of reciprocity and our responsibilities to each other in relationships. And even though this really came from the um, uh, what's known as the Assemblies of First Nations or AFN in Canada, it really cuts across the way that we would treat each other as Indigenous peoples generally. Um, so we feel that it's very, very applicable for us to work within the um, four R's for this book and have that as an underlying uh, underlying uh, principles that we work with. So as we get into this project, we have some um, guiding questions that we're uh, grappling with. So how do we create a system for vocabularies that comes from a place of reverence and respect? And how do we create a system that can be implemented across domains and meet future forward technological needs? So balancing or figuring out how to balance the the opportunities and constraints of technology, along with um, attention to protocols and um, governance. With this, we um, after the um, uh, webinar that we had in 2022, we pulled together partners that were uh, supportive of our endeavors within this area. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to them for funding the seed funding phase, which we are almost complete actually um, in June to be able to uh, work towards um, applying for larger grants and to be able to create, let's go to the next slide, the Indigenous Advisory um, Circle, which was established in May 2023. So we received the funding in, in January and worked towards creating um, uh, plans and work plans to be able to include um, the Indigenous Advisory uh, Circle established and then had some deep listening um, um, uh, uh, sessions with them in May 16th and 17th, uh, of which we which were facilitated by Ship, Ship Collective. Um, and we're very meaningful to be able to ground the project in the ways that we wanted to move forward. One of those things from Don uh, Johnson is from the Interclock Nation, which is uh, was located. What his hometown was Lytton, BC, but due to climate change, there was a huge fire, and that town is is no longer existing. It burned to the ground, um, and I think that's part of the work that we need to do is really critically uh, to be able to work with communities to preserve their the, to preserve knowledge, but also to to enact it um, as they have. Um, they had lived with fire for centuries, and uh, um, part of that is finding those deeper layers uh, to be able to address many of the challenges that we face today as communities with climate change. And he said, uh, we we talk about the right to be able to choose the names that we're known by, and therefore to our identities, to be able to choose that for ourselves. And I think it's very important to, critical to be able to do that. So really what we're talking about is this envisioning of a radical approach to vocabulary work and really requires guidance by Indigenous community um, alongside technical experts. Um, and we have another quote from that deep listening session from Colette Quatra, who's a member of the Métis Nation, where she says the time has passed where other people can speak for us. For me, I'm all about the self-determination and sovereignty. and It's time for us to fill in those gaps. So the design so this, process. Oh, go oh, sorry, go ahead. So the design process has helped us hone our ideas and incorporate the desires of the Indigenous Advisory Circle and get to the heart of what matters in the project. And our community goals, which are so center community voices, build relationships and governance structures, and use prototypes to bolster community design. So we're just heading into this period where we're starting this. Um, aspect of the project. And just to recognize the many people who are currently involved in this project. So we have our technical working group, 
which was formed in um, 2023. And ongoing relationships with several similar projects, including the Repertoire de Vedette Materiel, the RVM project, the Forward Linking project, the Homosaurus, um, plus more. So I want to announce that we also um, were successful in um, applying for a Mellon Foundation funding um, and a two-year grant for a total of $1.4 million US to do this work. Um, and that is with Dalhousie Mellon Foundation and the University of Fraser Valley as a support partner. And that's really the project components are, are to include a digital platform uh, to support tools and workflows um, and the co-creation of respectful terminologies and control vocabularies focused mainly on Indigenous peoples in North America uh, to be able to uh, work with project workflows to ensure timely, uh, appropriate and timely uh, cons consultation with relevant Indigenous communities that we're working with and to document those learning materials and create a multi-generational community of practice uh, to support multiple communities. And to do that, we've been able to uh, work within the uh, this area. And as you can see, they're very small, but these are the uh, responsibilities that are assigned to both the Indigenous Advisory Circle, the Technical Working Group, our relationship with NICLA, and uh, uh, council and our communities, and then also to the community engagement with our partners and other dissemination that we've been working with, um, uh, with knowledge mobilization to be able to. Um, um, so I will just briefly mention that we're going to do this work. We're, we're using prototyping um, as our methodology in uh, relation to working with communities. Um, this is working through uh, data workflows. So what's not well represented here is, well, you see that protocol consultation check, which is really where probably a lot of our um, heavier work is going to lie as we think about um, data governance. So we have lots of questions about data governance as we go into this as to how to, how to implement the kinds and protocol of protocols and ways of working as it relates to terminology, um, uh, which hasn't been done as much um, in our field. And flip this slide. Um, and I did wanna mention that, uh, that we are working obviously closely with Nicholas, the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance. And that um, as we work on this, uh, some of the research data may be held currently at Dalhousie, but will be and transferred to NICLA. Um, and any infrastructure that is created um, also is ultimately um, to be held uh, to be held by um, NICLA. Milestones really is the seed funding has been achieved, and that was the first phase. Phase two is moving to production. Now that's a long phase, and we expect that there will be. Uh, a need for uh, further grants and other um, and other um, um, requirements that we'll need to be able to do to be able to create with partnerships. But it really is about building the governance structure, prototypes, case studies, um, having the platform established, and uh, we're both working with some CERC and Mellon Mellon Foundation funding right now. And then we'll move to a sustaining mode. So our first gathering, we're fortunate enough to host it here in Stolo Tumuk at uh, the University of Fraser Valley on the 29th and 30th. And here's just a little snapshot of um, the gathering, which was located, um, it was called our foundational, our TPP foundational gathering. And it was located in a place called the Gathering Place, um, uh, which is um, uh, within the Stolo community and our university. And so with that, I uh, just want to say what we really hope to give to future generations is love and respect um, uh, in the way that we work with terminology. So we just ask people to uh, join us um, to work towards a better and more respectful future. And now we're open for questions, but we do want to say thank you, Madhu. I uh, raise my hands to you for sitting through this whole uh, presentation and um, and I want to say a um, huge thank you to um, my co-chair, Stacey Allison, and for doing that wrangling the decks, even though it's a little choppy there for a few minutes. So thank you so much. Thank you so much again, Stacey, Camille, and Diana.
I truly see your passion and dedication to indigenous data. And I think uh, we can open for questions and comments now. I still see some people try to join us uh, after 1 p.m. So this is truly a successful talk. And uh, I know you are all doing ongoing research projects and maybe at a certain time point, ISIS can invite you back to talk about your further studies. And uh, yeah, so everyone feel free. If you want to unmute yourself, make comments or questions, is, it's your time now. Hi, I'm Stacey Camille. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It's very helpful. Um, I mentioned that our group is beginning to form a list of resources, and I'll put that in the chat one more time. Uh, and we were largely thinking data sets, but we certainly uh, will include the respectful terminology platform project because a lot of what we do is also metadata and so um, you know having it done correctly is important as you have talked about and so um, that's something we want to do and then I had a question for Diana um, you mentioned that the data uh, you know that you and your team have worked with um, is restricted so some of our uh, participants today are from Canada and many of us are from other places, largely US, but likely from other places too. If a researcher who is not a member of your nation, uh, and I meant your indigenous nation, uh, is interested in trying to use the data, what would be the process? Thank you for that. Um, that's a really good question. And under uh, the research agreements that we sign and the protocols that we adhere to, um, that would be a decision of the First Nation or the Indigenous community I work with, Métis communities and uh, First Nation communities. And so it would not be up to me. Um, as the owners of the data, they would decide whether or not you could work with their data. What other questions do we have? So I said, feel free to either put in chat or honestly just unmute and we can uh, have you ask. Alex. Hi, um, thanks. I have a question for Diane. Um, this is actually from someone who had to leave early. So I'm just gonna read her question. Um, she was wondering if you could talk a bit about how the data management structure for your projects came together. Um, and she says, I imagine it took some work, some time to work out all the details with so many people, funders and organizations involved. So just about data, really data management. Another really great question. We're actually thinking about writing a manuscript about how this all happened. Um, the study that I showed you in 2019 that we did for Picto Landing First Nation in response to the environmental assessment um, process that was underway because of the remediation project, the community was funded to do another data gathering phase. And in that phase, we were guided by the First Nations Information Governance Center in Ottawa, who duplicated the process that they have for data gathering in their regional health surveys. Okay. And it's detailed in the uh, well-being report how that was done. And so when I came to the University of Guelph and started working with these additional communities and decided that we would implement a OCAP compliant lab, I could refer to the 2019 study that we had done and working with the uh, computer IT technology people here, data security people, they really guided us on what protocols we had to have in place to meet. So you have to meet HIPAA standards and ISO standards. The software that we got also requires certain infrastructure, certain tablets. And so we just were guided as we started to implement each piece of it. Um, and 
we are hoping to write about that. We just haven't gotten to it yet. Great. Um, and I just have a follow-up question to Bob Ray's question about um, getting access to the data. Um, as you said, it's really up to the First Nations or Métis communities to make that decision. Is there somewhere, if someone was interested in, in doing research and using the data, is there like an application form or someone they could contact or would they contact you and you would direct them? Uh, Nothing formal? Yeah, and so I am just a data steward. So the Indigenera Lab just holds the data. The data yeah. belongs to the community. Um, you have to understand data management in the context of the harms that have been done to Indigenous mm -hmm. communities and why they're really reluctant to share data for any other purposes than their own. So okay. communities are very reluctant to share data. Okay, thanks. I have a question for all three of you. Um, thank you for the presentation as well, both of yours. Um, so I'm at the University of New Mexico and we have data that was probably, I know we have data that was collected on, uh, indigenous peoples, not necessarily with them. <laughs> and so what are your thoughts about how they, um, you know, provide access to that data? Is it the, Diane, would you say it's the same process, um, working with the, uh, tribes or the nations to, um, uh, let them decide? um on that because it was you know collected in say the 70s or 80s um, on them um and uh, the other question i have is you know or sort of a comment one of my colleagues here um is working with hiding certain data at certain times of the year based on the, um, the tribe's um process or culture because they don't want to show certain things at certain times of the year because if it's part of their culture not to discuss that content. So I'll, I'll let you both, the three of you comment. Mm. When I think about previous data that's been collected and is housed, um, I know in the Tri-Council policy statement, we're required to hold data for a certain period of time. And then the researcher is allowed to destroy the data. Um, in the case of Indigenous data, I know that at the University of Guelph, there was a survey that was done in um, maybe in another venue, Lucia could talk about this. There was, there was and is data collected that um, is by people who don't, haven't heard of OCAP, haven't heard of CARE or FAIR or understand tri-council policy statement about um, access to data, who, who owns the data. Um, I think that in the case of Guelph, we're in the process in our research data management strategy, thinking about that, about what happens to the data that's still held, that truly belongs to community because it was collected without their permission. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, Diana already answered the that question um, quite well. I'll just speak to, um, in relation to access, so the question about seasonal um, access to materials. Um, so local context labels, if you have not heard of that um, uh, system is, I think, increasingly being used in collaboration. So again, the thing to stress always is that communities have the rights and should have the rights to say what is accessible what is not and how that is done. And so there are the local context labels that can be applied in, in repositories in different ways. They, uh, there is the uh, indigenous specific um, repository of, um, um, we could do, I think it's how it's pronounced. I'll have to check on that, but also 
other systems um, can you can integrate local context labels uh, into those systems. So again, that that is controls access to material. So whether something is permitted to be sort of accessed as a kind of outreach activity, whether something has seasonal ac uh, access, whether something is is particular to um, gender, but again, um, in the in their very, very useful, but they can't just be applied without um, community uh, collaboration because those, uh, again, can't just be taken out of the box, so to speak, like we maybe are used to with some of our other kinds of work that we do with data. And that's, I think, the important thing to stress. I think with a lot of non-Indigenous work, we're used to just picking up a schema or picking up a standard or working with a repository and doing as we need. Um, versus really thinking about it's not for um, anyone but the Indigenous peoples who are involved to to say how something should be handled. So really giving over that control in all aspects is, um, is really important. Yeah, I just would add something more to that, just thinking through um, current data breaches that have happened like there are data breaches that are still happening there are unethical processes still happening and collecting data um, things that are unfolding as we speak and I think maybe as an institution you really have to think about tightening up ethical protocols about the data that's in your possession that has been collected on Indigenous people um, and looking to develop as Guelph has data management strategies about how that data is managed internally in situations like you've just um, stated. Do uh, have shared some US based resources in the chat box just in case anyone, if you are interested in the US based data requests. And I think it would be very interesting later if we can have country to country conversation, especially in this kind of international community. We are, we are hoping to be able to. Uh get someone from the, I may not get the name exactly right, but from the Australian, I believe it's the Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, group. Uh, we tried in the past and uh, a number of health issues with someone there prevented, but we'll try that again. And the other is I'll just do an open call to everyone that's in this room right now and all of your friends. We're also, we would really love to be able to do things for different Latin American indigenous groups. So if anyone has a contact whatsoever, please contact one of us, and uh, we would love to do that. And as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, we would love to follow up with our presenters from today, uh, perhaps in the future, about uh, further progress. Yeah. Uh, we have recorded this webinar and I hope all those uh, presenters, you can share your slides with us so that if people cannot come today, they can still watch the video and see all the contents. And I know uh, due to the time limitation, maybe all of you three cannot finish everything on the slides. Uh, we still have like four minutes left. Do you have anything you want to emphasize or you want to elaborate a little bit more? If not, I probably will like stop the recording and to thank you everyone for your participation.